as you would have heard, we are recording this session. Um, I'm just going to allow a few more seconds to, to allow everybody to come in and join us, but we'll get started very shortly. Okay, it is one minute past, so we will get um, started. Thank you everyone for coming along today. My name is Dr. Emily Reeve. I'm a member of the ANZ Gin Regional Committee and a Senior Research Fellow at the Centre for Medicine Use and Safety at Monash University. Um, we welcome you and we're looking forward to some fantastic presentations with leading experts in guidelines today. Um, today we have Kelvin Hill from the Stroke Foundation, Ailey Langford from the University of Sydney, Amanda Buttery from the Heart Foundation, um, and Annika Bowman from SAMRI and CRE Stillworth. Today we're going to be discussing what an evidence-based guideline is and how they're developed. The webinar provides an overview to clinical guidelines and some of the different steps involved um, and we'll cover the why, the what and hopefully the how of guidelines as well. Uh, this webinar will be useful for those who are new to guideline development, so maybe have no experience or you're interested in de developing one. But hopefully it'll also be helpful to maybe some who have some experience but are wanting to understand the process a little bit better. Um, we'll hopefully talk about some of the common barriers, tips and tricks will be discussed um, and will there'll be opportunities to ask questions of our panel. Um, in the spirit of reconciliation, the ANZ Gin Regional Group acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to the elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. Um, I acknowledge and pay respects to the Wurundjeri people, the traditional custodians whose ancestral lands I'm presenting from today. So just a few notes about our webinar today. We're actually you've probably noticed we're in a Zoom meeting format rather than a Zoom webinar format. Um, so we do ask that you keep yourself muted. You're welcome to have your video on, um, but please remember that this meeting is being recorded and will be placed on our GIN YouTube channel. Um, our four invited speakers will each give a short presentation on a few different aspects of the guideline development process, and then we'll have time at the end for Q&A with all the speakers. Um, you're able to feel free to put your questions into the chat while they're giving their presentation, or there'll be an opportunity to, to lift up your hand um, in using the, the Zoom function in the Q&A time. Um, and as always, feel free to send us any feedback on our presentations. And in fact, you'll get a survey at the end, below, which I'll mention at the end. Um, Okay, and just finally, this is, um, feel free to um, tweet about this on, on social media and please follow us on our um, GIN account as well. So our presenters are gonna be touching on various aspects of the guideline development process. Um, the way we split it up, the topics may not necessarily be discussed in the order that you would do guideline development process, but we've tried to group kind of similar aspects and just give an overview of different aspects that might come across. Um, so our first presenter is Amanda Buttery. Welcome, Amanda. Um, I will stop my uh, screens and allow her to do her best. Thank you, Emily. I'll just share my screen. Is that coming up okay? Thank you. Um, so thank you very much for the um, opportunity to speak today um, about sort of getting started with clinical guidelines. So I'm here really just to speak about the, um, the first aspect of, of guidelines. And um, I'd really like just to acknowledge Stacey Matthews, who um, unfortunately couldn't be with us today due to illness, who's actually been involved in preparing all of these slides. So first of all, just an outline. Um, so. I'm going to just cover the why, the what and the how of clinical guidelines. So what they are, why they're important, um, what's the difference between a guideline and a consensus statement, just a little bit of an overview of guideline development and I'll touch on the NHMRC guidelines for guidelines and just cover a little bit about whether um, people should adopt or adapt um, other guidelines as well. 
So what are guidelines? Um, so their definition um, is that clinical practice guidelines are statements that include recommendations intended to optimise patient care that are informed by a systematic review of evidence and an assessment of the benefits and harms of alternative care options. So they're really tools that are focused um, for the information of healthcare professionals and ensure that patients receive the optimal care to achieve the best possible outcomes. One of the key points about clinical guidelines is that they're based on the latest high quality evidence available and they follow transparent development and decision making processes. So why are guidelines important? They're intended to promote positive health outcomes, prevent harm, encourage best practice and reduce resource waste. They promote consistency and excellence in clinical care and also enable the best outcomes for patients. So what's the difference between a guideline and a consensus statement? So a clinical guideline is really, it includes recommendations based on the best available evidence to direct clinical decision-making and practice. That's different from a consensus statement, which is really a comprehensive summary, often of the opinions of a panel of experts about a particular intervention, treatment, or way in which service should be delivered. So some of the key differences between guidelines and consensus statements is really that guidelines follow rigorous and established methods and standards. They involve high quality literature searching and summary of evidence tables. They are focused on health and related outcomes that are important to end users. And that the evidence and the body of evidence for each of these outcomes is considered. And so what I mean by that is that, say, for example, we're looking at an outcome such as mortality. Um, we look at the body of evidence related to that outcome when we're looking at our literature. So just a couple of examples here of the difference between um, what the Heart Foundation does in terms of um, clinical guidelines and consensus statements is that we have a clinical guideline on the management of acute coronary syndromes, which is related to heart attacks and angina and the clinical care once a patient arrives in the emergency department of a hospital, and that helps guide practice in terms of outcomes. Then we have something like a, um, a consensus statement, which we developed with a range of stakeholders, which was to address some of the disparities in managing acute coronary syndromes um, among uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander populations. So again, that's more of a consensus statement um, based on um, the opinions of a panel of experts. So just an overview of guideline development. So, um, the NHMRC, and this is a, a resource which I'd really um, let everyone know about, is a, if you don't already, I, I realise that some people on this call will be very familiar with the guidelines for guidelines, um, but just making sure that you um, go in and have a look at all of the different types of standards, how to plan, develop, review and implement a guideline. Um, this resource is very comprehensive um, and I would really highly recommend it to everyone. So just thinking about methods, um, sometimes when we start a guideline, we're thinking, oh, it, actually, there might have been another organisation that's published a guideline recently in another country, for example, that we think, should we just be able to adopt this or adapt it? Um, or, or do we need to focus on some specific questions that might not have been available in another international guideline? So what we talk about when we're talking about the difference between adoption and adaption is particularly around an adoption of a recommendation that might be um, related to an existing trustworthy recommendation that we don't think actually needs any modification and is relevant um, to a, our population in which we're um, making the guideline for. So an example might be, um, for, for us at the Heart Foundation is we have the American Heart Association guidelines. They do a lot of guidelines. And again, some of the recommendations that are in those guidelines um, are somewhat um, applicable to all populations, particularly in regards to some of the evidence re related to medicines and treatment. And so we might just actually adopt the recommendation from another existing guideline. 
However, there's often situations where that we can't just say the recommendation is exactly the same for our population and we need to adapt it, for example. Um, and that involves um, identifying relevant clinical questions and searching for existing guidelines that address those questions and making sure that we're still going through that process of critically appraising them and deciding whether to accept or modify at all some of those recommendations. And so that would be particularly relevant for, for example, a rural or remote population, whereby it might not be applicable in Australia and therefore we'll need to be thinking about potentially a new recommendation. And that's where the de novo recommendations come in, where we might be formulating a new question specifically related to rural and remote populations because it hasn't been considered yet in other published guidelines. So we've just got a nice example here of um, a paper by Dodd and, and colleagues, um, just about deciding whether to adopt, adapt or start from scratch. Um, and so some of the, the reasons why you might um, adopt and adapt also relate um, just in terms of efficiency, and we wanna try and avoid duplication as well. Occasionally, we think that um, adoption and adaption may be less resource intensive. However, for those who have been through the process of adoption and adaption, it still is quite resource intensive because we still need to go in, look at all the evidence summaries and decide, um, usually with our panel, uh, with our expert steering panels, whether it's still suitable to do that. Just in terms of resources, um, when, when starting out and looking at a guideline, there is a great deal of resources available, which are very comprehensive. And so I've just provided a list here of some of the, um, the great websites that you can look at to get more information. Also to consider is the in-guide training, um, which again is, is excellent for anyone who is thinking about doing a guideline and would like some and have identified that they need some more training in the, in the area. Um, and it's a really a comprehensive evidence-based training program for guideline developers. That's a joint partnership between the Guidelines International Network and McMaster University. And there's a link on this page again, which you can access. So just in summary, so getting started can be overwhelming, but there's um, certain methods and approaches um, that can also vary a little bit, which can sometimes be a little bit confusing when starting out. However, what we do have among the um, guideline developers um, resources is that we do have a lot of great resources and training to draw on. Um, and also that I think it's just fair to say that guideline developers are generally a pretty friendly group. And if you have a question, then always reach out to, to people who are also involved in the field. Just in summary, um, also just as I mentioned, Stacey unfortunately couldn't be here today, but please do get in touch as well. So thank you. Thank you so, so much, Amanda. I think that's given us a really great introduction to, to guidelines. Uh, next up, we have Ailey Langford, um, who's going to talk a little bit about um, yes, getting the right people involved or talking to the right people. Thank you, Ailey. Great, thank you, Emily, and thanks for having me at this webinar today. Um, as Emily mentioned, I'm going to talk about stakeholder engagement uh, sort of throughout the whole process of guideline development, um, right from the planning stages uh, through to the end stages of public consultation. Um, I also just wanted to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, uh, which is the land that I am presenting on today. Uh, so when you're beginning developing a guideline, uh, one of the first considerations that you may have is who is actually going to be developing this guideline and what members are going to be part of the guideline development team. Uh, and this is a really important consideration uh, because, as this quote suggests, the composition of the group who are developing the guideline will ultimately influence the recommendations which are made. So an initial first step is often uh, selecting the chair or the person who is going to be leading the guideline development effort. Um, and then it's really about looking at the structure and the complexity of the group that is going to be recruited. And there's quite a few considerations uh, when determining this um, composition uh, and, and the type of guideline group uh, that will be de developed. And one of the first considerations is the size of the guideline group. 
And there's no hard or fast rules about exactly how many people you need on a guideline development group. Uh, the World Health Organization suggests eight to 12 members. Uh, and I think this number tries to uh, account for having diversity on the group, as well as ensuring efficiency of processes, because obviously the more people you have, um, the more difficult it is to um, account for everyone in terms of the administrative side and, and uh, I guess factor in everybody's perspectives on a particular recommendation. Uh, we did have 17 uh, group members on the recent guideline uh, that I was a part of, uh, which I suppose is in excess of that recommended number. But at the same time, we still had criticisms during the public consultation period about not having um, enough representation from different stakeholder groups. So it really is weighing up those pros and cons of, of the group size number. Um, and then secondly, the composition. Uh, so here um, in this little diagram, I've tried to uh, summarize some of the main people you may want to have on your guideline development group. The NHMRC really uh, encourages a range of expertise and experience uh, within this group, um, particularly for end users. So um, you might be thinking about who your guideline is targeting. Is there specific healthcare professionals that are mainly going to be using this guideline um, and having representation um, from them within the group? You obviously want methodological experts, people who have experience and knowledge about the guideline development process, uh, people with research and content expertise, and then consumers who are going to be affected by the particular um, topic that your guideline is covering. Uh, in addition, there may be uh, representation required from particular population groups. Uh, here in Australia, it's really encouraged to have representation from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, particularly if the content area of the guideline um, is going to affect Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health. Um, and I suppose the last sort of consideration that I think is really important is the concept of conflicts of interest um, and determining whether people who you are planning to recruit to the guideline group have major conflicts of interest that may uh, preclude their involvement or may influence um, their particular perspectives on the guideline content area um, and perhaps not including people who have clear conflicts of interest but also thinking about conflict of interest for people who are recruited to the team, um, ensuring that those conflicts are transparently declared and managed if possible. So um, documenting what those conflicts of interest may be and perhaps um, having uh, processes in place, for instance, uh, someone may be excluded from making um, comment on a particular recommendation if they have a particular perceived conflict um, that may influence that process. Uh, more broadly than just the uh, intimate guideline development group, uh, it's important to think about engaging other stakeholders. Uh, and I've listed a few different types of organizations or groups that you may want to consider uh, involving. And it's quite great to involve these types of groups early on in the process. Uh, so they, one, have buy-in. Um, and if you're looking for their assistance with implementation uh, towards the end of the guideline development process, it's really great to have had their involvement early on in the process. Um, for instance, in our guideline, we were working with NPS Medicine Wise, and we're hoping to have their input in terms of the implementation processes. So we actually had a representative um, from that group on our guideline development team, which doesn't necessarily always have to be the case, but um, engaging with these groups early on. And it also helps to have an understanding of what the end users are looking for. And throughout the guideline development process, um, making your guidelines more in implementable um, by having the engagement of these important groups. Um, so this may be professional societies, uh, it may be consumer or advocacy groups, um, it will really depend on your topic area. Um, but yes, getting them involved, uh, even early on in the planning stages can be really beneficial downstream. Uh, one other thing that we did for our particular guideline that I thought I would highlight um, was doing sort of an in-depth analysis of stakeholder perspectives. So we conducted two qualitative studies uh, with important end user groups, uh, the first being healthcare professionals. And then we also did a study with um, opioid consumers because our guideline topic was on opioid deprescribing. Um, and of course, there may not be the, the time or resources to do this for every guideline. It's, it's definitely not mandatory. But I thought I would highlight this because it was a really important aspect for our guideline, which helped us to help define our scope and the content. Um, and sometimes there are uh, funding or resource requirements where you may not be able, say, to have multiple consumers on your guideline development group uh, because 
because uh, you don't have the funding necessarily to reimburse those people for their time and contribution. Uh, but for us, this was a way to assess the perspectives of a huge range of consumers with different lived experiences um, and feed that into our guideline recommendations through um, an evidence to decision framework, which I, I think someone's going to talk about a little bit later on in this presentation. Uh, but I think I just wanted here to highlight that there are different ways to engage stakeholders throughout the process. And, and this was one way we chose to do it in our guideline. And to finish off, um, at the other end uh, of the guideline development process, we have public consultation. And this is an opportunity to send your draft guideline out to the public um, and receive feedback. Um, and I think if you think uh, sending out a publication for peer review is daunting, uh, this is a whole another level where maybe hundreds of people will provide feedback on your guideline. Uh, but I think it's such a worthwhile process because uh, I know from my personal experience, our guideline was so much better for having the input of so many people um, uh, and so many individuals and organisations. So the, the basic process is firstly planning for consultation, so defining the parameters of what type of feedback you want to receive. Um, this will also involve uh, stipulating the duration of the public consultation feedback. Um, the NHMRC requires a minimum of 30 days, but it can be quite beneficial to have an even longer period because uh, in terms of administration for big organisations and things, uh, receiving the request, sending it out to relevant people, collating responses um, and returning it to the guideline developers, that can take quite a bit of time. Uh, but for your benefit, it's really important to have specific deadlines about when that public consultation period will close um, and maybe have processes in place to determine how you will respond to people who to request um, extensions, for instance, uh, on these deadlines. Uh, in terms of the conducting process, you need to figure out how you're going to notify the public. If you're working with something like the NHMRC, they will assist with um, some of the notifications, but you need to think about um, where you're going to host the guideline, how people are going to provide you with the response, uh, whether you have a template that they can fill out, um, and also requesting information from the respondents like um, contact information of someone if you need further clarification about feedback um, or what information they are happy to have published um, along with their response, whether they want to remain anonymous or, or have their, their contact details named. And then finally, it's the process of responding to that feedback. Um, so sending that out to the whole guideline development group, uh, regardless of whether you're planning to make modifications to the guideline based on that feedback or not, and then really transparently reporting um, the decisions that are made. Um, and my final slide here just has an example from the NHMRC website of how you may tabulate the um, public consultation feedback. Um, you may have the, the comment made by the um, respondent and then how your guideline development group um, responds and what actions were taken. So how the guideline was, was or wasn't modified uh, based on that feedback that was received. Uh, so that concludes my part of the presentation, a bit of a whirlwind from the start to the end of the guideline development process um, and a few ways that you can involve stakeholders throughout. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ailey. That was um, really interesting and, and great to hear about all the different stakeholders that you engaged. Uh, next up, we have Kelvin Hill, who's going to um, talk a little bit more about some of the planning as well as, you know, getting into the, the end of making the recommendations as well. Unmute. There we go. Um, thanks very much and um, great uh, introductions from the team. So I'm Kelvin Hill. I oversee our guidelines at the Stroke Foundation in Australia and I've been doing guidelines almost 20 years now. So um, I'm just going to cover some of the aspects. As I said, um, we're sort of jumping around a little bit. But the things that I'm going to cover is the um, planning, um, considerations for budgets, and then also moving from um, how do we how do we move from the actual evidence through to making recommendations? So that's sort of the final piece. Um, and then I'll hand back to Anika, who will talk about the PICOs. So um, a bit of that step. So we'll, um, again, just to uh, um, reiterate, we've got some great resources here in Australia. I know that, and notice there's there's quite a few. Um, joining us from overseas. So very, very great of you to join us. Um, and there is a lot of different resources out there as Amanda um, pointed out for, for guideline development. 
Here in Australia, our National Health and Medical Research Council has some, some great um, resources and tools, and I've certainly drawn from that and certainly recommend um, if you're starting out to have a look at that resource. So planning. Um, guidelines are a complex project. Often they will take between 18 months and two years to, to develop as from, uh, as, from scratch. Uh, our stroke guidelines historically have taken um, about that two year time frame for an update. Um, we've recently moved to become living guidelines. So we're constantly doing things, but planning and processes are really critical for guidelines. So the things obviously that we, we need to consider as we're developing our plan is what's the scope of our guidelines? Um, obviously the more complex, the more topics that we cover, the more work that needs to be done, that all needs to be factored into the planning and timeframes. So scoping is probably one of the most important things we do. Often this can be done, and I'll touch on this when I talk about um, funding, but often to get the funding, you have to do a number of these steps um, before you go to funding sources. But so scope is one of those things that often is done very early on. But once we actually start in earnest and you get the, the groups together, the, the experts and, and the steering committee, as, as we've just heard, um, you need to then revisit the scope and refine because that, that's just critical, what, what to cover um, and be realistic about that. Stroke guidelines are terribly unrealistic. We cover way too many topics, um, too broad. Um, and so, the planning and the processing around that needs to be thought out and, and carefully considered. So the governance we've all, already heard about, who do we need to involve in this process? And, and what are the methods, so what, uh, as, as Amanda pointed out right at the start, there's, there's gray areas between a fully, you know, you view whiz bang um, evidence-based guideline and a more consensus approach, or do we need to adapt, adopt, um, so there's lots of things to consider in the methods um, and then how that, in, in what resourcing and planning you need to do related to those decisions. Um, obviously there's timelines and the more experience you have on guidelines, the easier it becomes to planning. It's a bit like um, when you do anything the first time, uh, things often can drag on. So being really um, realistic particularly around the evidence searching, appraising, collating, and then getting the, the governance and the, and the people involved to interpret and draft recommendations. It takes time and, and budgeting enough time is the critical thing. And then there's cost. So um, being able to fund the whole process because often there's multiple people involved, multiple experts that you need to do. So, what are the things that we need to consider around budgets? Lots of things. And in Australia, the NHMRC has done a report and essentially to do a fully fledged two year um, big guideline, it costs approximately a million dollars uh, on average. Some, some people do it cheaper than that and some people you know, might spend a little bit more depending on the complexity. There is a lot of things to consider. There's the overall project management. So there's the nuts and bolts of probably most of the people online um, who are either methodologists or, or project managers. So we need to be paid and cover our salaries. Methodologists need to be paid. So whether you have that in-house or whether you're going to outsource methodology support uh, needs to be considered. Who's going to undertake your evidence synthesis? Is that going to be done in-house? Do you have the resources? Or is that going to be outsourced as well? So there are groups that do that. Um, there might be collaborations with certain academic facilities to do this, or um, Cochrane groups, for example, can, can do um, some of the evidence synthesis now, um, but that needs to be factored into the budgets. Do you need to have technical writers or editors involved? Do you have, you know, as the organisations and your team got enough uh, experience in, in writing guidelines and being careful about the terminology and the wording and the consistency, um, that all needs to be considered. 
Um, and then it's just the logistics, so bringing people together. So we've, we've all been working off Zoom, and you can do that, we, we do that, but having that face-to-face -face discussions, particularly the training, so bringing the groups together, training them, giving them an overview about the, the approach and the process and the methods so that they have that background and can make decisions in a timely manner. And then there's the consultation process that we just heard about. So do we need to allocate some time just doing that process and engaging various groups, are there fees and, and that on it can be considered. Um, once you develop your guidelines, there's obviously um, communication, dissemination, um, the whole marketing side of it and do, is that thing something that, that we need to factor into budgets. Um, implementation is, you know, what strategies you can do to follow up. And is there software that, that you choose to use uh, and there's normally a cost for that. So with Stroke, we, we use the Magic platform um, that we find very efficient and publish that online, uh, but that, that has a cost as well and that needs to be considered. So there's a lot of things to consider and that all needs to be considered within those, the framework of the scoping and who's involved and what the methods are. So there is quite a lot to consider in this space. So I'm now just going to, I don't have any magic bullets about um, funding. I, I might say that there's multiple sources of funding. So um, whether it's, it's government funding, depending on the scope and what your topic is. So you can look for funding, um, pro funding, there might be um, colleges and professional organisations, there might be academic funding, there might be research funding. Um, and all avenues need to be considered. Um, guidelines can be expensive. And certainly here in Australia, we don't have um, a one centralised funding model like um, some centres like the UK have. Um, so there is different pots, whether it's federal government, state government. Um, so be really clear about who the primary stakeholder and, and for Stroke, for example, we had a long amount of engagement with funders and for us is federal government. Um, but there's, to have that engagement in the relationship with potential funders is really important. And to be opportunistic often is, is the case with funding. So now I'm just going to leave funding and talk about the process of moving from evidence, so collating the evidence, finding the evidence, um, and then how do we develop the recommendation? Um, a couple of my colleagues have, have mention it but the key thing in, in guideline development is transparency being clear about what you're doing and the assumptions that you make so we at the stroke foundation and i think more and more commonly um, here in australia but also internationally are uh, adopting and using the grade methodology just because it's a transparent um, process and you you know what factors are being considered and that's all documented and clear so that, that all the groups and um, for us it's all transparent because it's all online you can see what's um, what's been interpreted and, and how and, and why there's a logical progression between the, the research the local implications and the systems considerations and the recommendations that, that evolve so grade specifically is a framework for the systematic and transparent assessment of any and, and all relevant documentation going from evidence to recommendation. So there's a couple of just finally, there's two slides that I've poached from the magic team and um, give them credit for this. So there's essentially five steps, broad steps to going from evidence to recommendation. The first one over here is the input, there's three inputs. And then there's a process, and then there's to spit out the recommendations then. The three things that we need to do is to work out what are we trying to answer? And, and Anika is going to talk to us about the PICO, developing your PICO. So they're the, the building blocks to find, to search for the evidence and find the evidence to answer the questions that we want in these guidelines. So we want to write your clinical question into a PICO structure. We then undertake a systematic review, looking at multiple databases, finding relevant um, studies, whether that's randomized controlled trials, systematic reviews, or other, other sources, depending on your question. 
that all gets fits into the system. And obviously, as you um, look at those papers, you're looking at um, extracting you know, data authors, uh, date, you know, your standard things, but then making an assessment on the quality of the information. How well was, how rigorous was the methods conducted? Are there sources of bias that we need to be concerned about or aware of? So that's part of this quality assessment, how confident we are around the, um, the effect estimate or the, the overall. They've done a meta-analysis and they say that this is your odds ratio or this is the point estimate. How confident are we? How much uncertainty is there still? Um, and that, that will certainly feed into the groups then the stakeholders and your, and your content experts making a decision. So normally in the step four, the middle step here, we're bringing out our content experts together. We've got, we've, and we've collated all the relevant evidence. We've drawn out a summary in our, in a, in normally um, profiles or evidence tables, so that they're succinct. And um, we bring it together by considering a minimum of four, Great has four minimum criteria. There are additional criteria to consider. Um, but certainly the four minimum are what are the, what's the point estimate? What's the benefits to this treatment? And what are the potential harms? So what's the expected benefit on average? And then we want to consider what's the overall confidence that we have. So this is the quality assessment component that we've done. But we do that at an individual level, uh, individual trials and papers. And here in step four, we're looking at What's the overall confidence? Because we do the, the, the quality based on the outcomes that we've chosen as the, as the critical outcomes. Um, and so we want to know overall for all of the outcomes of, of choice, how confident are we with the overall? So that's the, the quality of evidence. We then want to understand, is there differences or variations in the values and preferences of various interventions? Um, for stakeholders, particularly consumers. So where the benefit and harm is less clear, so whether there's, there's some benefits, but there's also some harms, then values and preferences become a critical consideration. Obviously, if there's really, really clear benefits with not many harms, most people will want the clear benefit, want the intervention because it's got the clear benefit. Um, so where values and preferences become really critical is when there's um, some benefits and some harms to consider. And the final factor that, that groups need to consider is the resource implications. What's the, is there a cost? Is there you know, uh, equipment? What, you know, how hard is it to implement this into clinical practice and what do we need to consider? So by Thinking about those four minimum criteria in grade, and there's others like equity and um, uh, like other ones, acceptability, feasibility. So um, all of those things are, trans uh, are put down in the grade profiles and considered by the working group in order to then make a final recommendation. So again, you've got all these issues that you've articulated that are transparent. And then we are really clear about why we're recommending what we are. We're giving it a, a grading. So whether we it's a conditional recommendation or whether it's a really strong recommendation and the rationale that the working group has, has made in, in coming to that decision. And all that needs to be um, transparent and uh, articulated. Simple process, really, this guideline development. Um, so, again, most, some of you will, will have seen slides like this. This is the whole guideline development process summarised um, and going from defining your FICO, finding relevant studies, extracting the relevant information for your outcomes. So if you look at this slide, the top half or the blue half of the slide is about finding the evidence to answer your questions. The bottom half is about making an assessment of that evidence for each of the health contexts that we're making recommendations for. And this requires the, the, the grey areas and panel members and discussions and perspectives to be shared and for those, those factors to be considered. The 
benefits and harms, the quality and certainty that we have around, around those um, estimates, values and preferences, and any resources. Um, and then coming up. So it's a, it's a big process. It requires really careful planning. It does cost, it's not insignificant cost. And that's why I think working smarter, having the tools and resources now to more easily share between groups. You see that much more, and certainly COVID's um, been a great example of how we can share much more um, across different organisations and across the world. Um, but they're the, they're the sort of critical things to take uh, to be aware of moving from um, evidence into recommendations and for careful planning and budgets. Thank you so much, uh, Kelvin. Uh, you know, I'm not sure about the, the simple process there, but uh, no, I think you've given us a, a lot of information about, about the process and some real great insights there. And our final um, presenter this morning is Annika Bowman, um, who is going to be telling us a little bit more about one of those steps of the, developing the PICO question. So thank you so much, Annika. Thank you. Um, I'm Annika Bowman. I'm a research fellow with the South Australian Health and Medical Research Institute and also with the Centre of Research Excellence in stillbirth here in Australia. Um, I'm going to talk about PICO questions today, which Kelvin touched on briefly, but I'm going to delve into it with a little bit um, more depth and talk about how we use PICO to um, effectively create searches to get that literature that we need to form or update guidelines. Um, so the scope of guidelines has to be translated into a series of questions. So with uh, PICO, we, we formulate those questions to be PICO questions, because sometimes we don't have all the components that we need in the questions when they come out of our expert, um, expert group or the consultation with our expert panel. So PICO stands for population or um, groups of patients, interventions, or that also encompasses our prognostic factors or our exposure groups, our control or our comparison, and then also our comparator and then our outcome. So our outcome relates to what we can improve, what we can measure, or what we um, want to answer our question. So I have a series of PICO questions there that, uh, that fulfill all of these, all of the components of PICO. So you can see for diabetic patients, what is the effect of metformin on blood sugar compared with ice cream? So you can see each of the components of PICO are encompassed within that question and I've highlighted them. So that's a therapy type question, but we also have different areas of our guidelines that involve prevention or etiology. And with each of these different uh, areas of our guidelines, we can formulate PICO questions um, with all of the population intervention control or outcome components. So with each of the components, we can then pull them out of our question and pop them into this table. So this table has each of the PICO elements, and then you can see that for each of the questions, not necessarily in the order that it was in the, the um, components were in the question, we can populate this table effectively, and this helps us formulate our search strategy and make sure that we are answering the question effectively with all of the components that we need um, in our literature. Now, some questions relating to diagnosis or diagnostic testing, prognosis or meaning, or meaning can also relate to experience, which sometimes we include within our guidelines. Um, sometimes they don't have a control or a comparison. So when you're trying really, really hard to get the question to fit PICO and can't get it to fit, maybe take a step back and think, does it actually have a comparison group? Maybe this, this um, column on my table is gonna be a none. So then we only have three components fulfilled um, within the PICO uh, framework. So for example, is minimally invasive um, tissue sampling accurate in diagnosing cause of death following stillbirth or neonatal death? Um, so there's no comparator in this question and that's okay. We don't have to fulfill all the requirements to fill the table to fulfill PICO. So um, 
sometimes, especially with experience, we're looking at the type of experience. So for example, pregnant mothers diagnosed with intrauterine and fetal demise, how do they perceive bereavement care? So we'd um, populate the box slightly, the boxes slightly differently. Um, just to move on and go a little bit out of the scope of my talk today from Pico, I wanted to show you how this uh, framework relates to writing a search strategy. So how we get from these questions to the PICO framework to writing an actual search strategy. So I've taken the first row um, in this table and just taken out the components and shown you how they relate to um, the actual search. So we want every single component within, that, within the columns of that table encompassed within um, the literature that we're pulling from the different databases. So moving on from that, I want to talk a little bit about my area. So I work with the stillbirth CRE and we develop the care after stillbirth and neonatal death guidelines. So with our work in this, in this area, we have a massive expert committee. We definitely um, haven't stuck to the minimum number. We've, we've got nearly 20 to 30 involved in that expert panel because of all the consumers and um, all of the experts that are involved with stillbirths neonatal deaths and um, terminations after fetal anomalies are diagnosed. So when the expert committee gets together, we look at, um, we look at um, the questions that they put together. So one of the questions that came out of that committee was how do we ensure that healthcare providers are aware of the common reasons why consent for autopsy following stillbirth or neonatal death is not obtained? So that's not a PICO question. And very often when we talk to the expert committee and everyone um, comes together, the questions that come out aren't PICO questions. So we have to work through a process to make sure that our searches are related to PICO questions that are addressing the information needs of the expert committee. So from there, we move on to, well, they're actually asking what are the barriers to consent for autopsy, whether they be refusal of con consent, whether they be distance, um, to get the autopsy, they want to look at the barriers. Then we can formulate that into a PICO question. So we're looking at the parents' consent for autopsy following um, stillbirth or neonatal death. And from here, we can highlight the sections of our PICO question that relate to the population, the intervention, there's no comparison or control for this question, and the outcome. So from here, I hope you can um, kind of reflect back on how we put the search together and you can see how we get from the scope of the guidelines to a series of questions to moving them into the information needs, the PICO questions and then our search strategies. Um, and this is really a, a, a long process but it's really important that we document each step in this process so that we are transparent and can go back and see exactly, exactly what we wanted at the start, exactly how we addressed it. And sometimes you do actually come out with more than one PICO question for the question from the expert committee or for the needs of the guidelines. And um, that's where we end up with multiple searches and why guidelines um, take so long. <laughs> All right, so I'll leave it there for now. This was just a quick update on PICO. And um, if you've got any questions, please feel free, feel free to ask at the end. Thank you so much, Annika. That was a, a wonderful presentation um, and, and some great examples there, so particularly, you know, discussing that sometimes there isn't a, a comparator and, and how to formulate them. That was um, really interesting. Um, so now we have about or just over um, 10 minutes left for some question time. I've been keeping my eye on the chat, but I haven't seen any questions come through. We might start with maybe asking each of our presenters. Um, what is, I guess, what are the common mistakes or the barriers or the kind of the, the most difficult parts of the guideline development process and maybe a, a tip for, for managing them? So we might start with Amanda. Um, sure. Thanks, Emily. Um, I think I'll come back to the, the, the start of the guideline and actually um, the process of selection of the expert panel. Um, I think we've been doing some work on that just recently, and it's probably at the front of my mind. Um, it's just about who's involved in selecting the panel is also really important because even those in, who are involved in selection will um, need to be 
um, free from bias as well and not have their conflicts um, <laughs> in terms of who, who they think should be selected. And just to have a, a really a standard sort of rigorous approach to sort of that sort of people and culture aspect of, of who, what sort of diversity do we want on our panels? What's the balance between our um, potentially our chairs of each of our subgroups. Have we got a 50-50 a split, for example, between men and women on our panels and also chairing some of our expert groups as well? What sort of diversity do we have within the groups? Um, everything from ethnicity to age to, to expertise. And I think some of those, um, the more a, a diverse a panel is, I think the, the better a guideline. So that's probably something that's at the front of my mind at the moment. Wonderful, thank you, Amanda. Um, Ailey? Yes, I think um, unlike some of the other panelists, I'm very new to guideline development and this guideline that we undertook as part of my PhD was my first. Um, so I think probably some of the methodological aspects I found uh, the most daunting. I think uh, Kelvin gave a great overview of, of the great approach, um, which seemed all a little bit scary to me when I was first undertaking it. So I think that um, was the most uh, difficult part for me, but I think that was compensated by having uh, that expert team surrounding me. So um, I was fortunate to have some really experienced methodologists on our team, as well as people who had experience conducting guidelines themselves. So I think the uh, takeaway message there is to surround yourself with other experts, um, because that's the easiest way to uh, learn and, and, and find your way. So that would be my response. Thank you. And that, I mean, that actually then ties back into what Amanda was saying, that having the right people from the outset actually then helps the, the process when those other difficult things come up. Uh, Kelvin. Yeah, I think mine's the same. Um, certainly, and, and it's not just the, the whole, it's the panel, but the chair is critically important for the success. Um, so finding really good chairs that uh, you know, the, the trick for, for any guidelines, um, for our guidelines, is, is you want the, you know, the key opinion leaders, you know, involved, but often they're the ones that are um, the busiest. And so you sort of want to balance out getting the right experts involved, but those who actually have the time and energy to, to effectively contribute. And that's that's a tricky balance. So I think, I think you're right. I was very lucky um, when I first started that the NHMRC actually formally paired you with, with methodologists to give you that support. So having that, that group of, of people that you can draw on um, and the wider community it is absolutely critical and, and, and very valuable. So having those people in place and people you can talk to. Um, and then, yeah, just getting the right um, planning. So without, depending if you outsource your systematic review, but we, we did ours in-house and so, just being realistic about the time it takes and um, yeah that would have been good to be a bit more realistic when I first started. Thanks Kelvin. Um, Annika. Thanks. I, um, I, think, I think it relates to my last slide actually is um, forming the questions making sure everyone's on the same page and I'm going to put my hand up and say I, I really um, had an issue with this at the beginning um, where I actually went down the path of writing and running searches and then um, came back to the group and they said, well, this doesn't relate to what we what we wanted. <laughs> so I had to go back and then realize that this process is just so important and being really transparent with it and going back to your expert panel saying, is this what you meant? And not being worried about bugging too much or, or being overbearing because at the end, it's a lot smoother and you've got what you've wanted. You've not wasted time going down a rabbit hole of the wrong question. Um, the other thing that I think um, has been touched on a little bit is with the expert panel, um, realizing that you, you want a diverse range of culturally, cultural representatives on that panel, including consumers and sometimes the format in which we hold the meetings or send the documentation is not always appropriate for everyone on that panel. So from the get-go, making sure that you've discussed with everyone their expectations of, is this a yarning circle? Um, how do you want the literature? How do you want the, the documents sent out to you so that everyone can be involved really effectively? Otherwise, you end up with, um, from my experience, you end up with people not talking up and not speaking when they want to. Yeah. 
That's great. And that actually um, relates to one of the questions that has come through on, on the chat, um, which is many guidelines lack patient representative involvement. What might be the challenges and how to improve this? So Annika, you were just saying that, you know, actually finding out how, you know, how to best engage them, how to, um, what style they want the information in. Do you want to um, speak any more about that? Yeah. Um, so I, I guess an example I can draw on is our, our um, we have a consumer advisory board at Samri and um, one of the things we went into the first session saying is how do you how do you want to do this do we do this in a park do we do this with children um, do we do this without children it, it, just acknowledging that they might not want it in the format that's been traditional and um, being really flexible with um, making sure that they can be heard and they can have a say and feel like um, their voice is important because you've acknowledged that this might be a bit harder for them to engage in. Yeah, just just to add as well um, on the um, some of the challenges with um, consumer representation in guidelines um, at the Heart Foundation, we've gone through a bit of a process actually of, of sometimes having consumers on some of our panels, but we've actually now moved a little bit more to just having a, a separate consumer panel whereby we do some of that um, almost translation between our expert groups and our consumer panel to just make sure that um, we're presenting that information to our consumer panel in a way that's appropriate for them. We get what we need from the, the, the sort of the expert sub to then pass back to the expert um, subgroup so that then they can really take on board our consumer um, views. And that seems to be working quite well. We do have a consumer representative on our expert steering group for one of our guidelines. But again, a, a, a consumer with um, a certain skill set, um, he was involved in um, many uh, long documents due to um, <laughs> uh, um, being a, a procurement officer at a, at a sort of um, health centre and a few things like that. So again, um, just someone who's actually really comfortable reading long documents is actually just a, a really crucial part of, of um, being involved from a consumer perspective in a guideline, I think. Thanks, Amanda. We do have a, another question in the chat, which was asking about automation tools that can help speed up the data synthesis and stages of guideline development. And Danielle's very helpfully um, put a link in, which actually has a website with many of these. But um, maybe, I guess, if any of our panelists have experience using any that they would like to share while we're here. I guess, did you use any <laughs> in, in your guidelines? We've been lucky in Stroke, um, been working quite a lot with Cochrane Australia um, and Steve McDonald is, our, is the Chief Information Specialist and does all the, the searching. Um, and, and Cochrane have been you know, playing around as, as many other groups in, in how to improve the efficiency. So certainly um, the classifiers, so some of the, the automated ways of screening out things that are clearly not going to be randomised control trials if you're looking at interventions. Um, those sort of things we have applied um, and it reduces, depending on, this, on the topic, it, it can reduce the workload, the manual workload of, of screening by about 50%. Um, so that's certainly something that, that we've done. Um, yeah. And we obviously use Magic App as the sort of all-in-one um, platform, which is certainly uh, an improvement from when we had you know, Excel spreadsheets and Word documents and trying to manage everything in different ways in the past. So yeah, there, there's the, the couple of things that we've used, but I think there's a lot of a lot of scope to further improve the um, the tools and and the process. Mm -hmm. I think there's, um, you know, I feel like even over the past couple of years, there have been new things come out. I wouldn't be surprised if doing a systematic review in five to years' time perhaps looks different to how we do them now, which will be really interesting. I think, and something that was, was mentioned by several of our presenters is that transparency is so important for guidelines. And the risk is, and this may be just my thinking, that when you introduce some kind of automated method or software it opens it up for, for criticism of what, you know, well, how do you know that you actually found all the right studies? So I think there will, it will require a bit of a process of, you know, end users being accepting of 
those tools or processes or, or software that get used as, as well. So I think that's definitely kind of a, a watch this space. It would be great if we didn't have to do all the manual screening and, and data extraction, that would absolutely make it easier. So we're actually, um, we're kind of just a minute before the hour or half hour, depending where you are. So we will end there. Um, I'll just, sorry, share my final screen, which says thank you to everybody. Thank you very much for joining us today to listen and for your questions. Thank you so much to our presenters um, for coming along today and sharing your experience. If you have further questions or you want further information, check out our website, the ANZ Guideline Network. And as been mentioned by a few of our presenters, the Guideline for Guidelines Handbook from the NHMRC. Um, we will be sending out a survey at the end of this. Um, please do fill it out. It is so helpful for us to be able to plan future webinars, to know what you like, what worked, what else um, you might like to see. Um, and generally, if you have any other feedback or if you would like to be connected with our network or the international network, um, send us an email. So thank you all very much. Um, have a wonderful day uh, wherever you are. Okay, bye.